Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. So what's your reaction to this? Can a deal get done when the Democrats and Republicans are on different pages? Yeah, look, I mean, anything we put out, the Democrats and Chuck Schumer were going to attack. Uh, let's, forget, let's not forget there's an election in about two and a half months, and they want to win those seats. So we could have put up, we could have taken their bill and filed it, and they would have said, well, it's not good enough. We want more. That's just a part of the political game. Ultimately, look, this bill touches on a lot of bases and things that we need to do. The way this place works is we can't pass a bill without Democrats supporting it as well. And we obviously have to get it through the House, which is controlled by the Democrats, and it has to be signed by President Trump, who's a Republican. So this bill is going to have to touch a lot of things and do a lot of things. It's not going to be easy to get there, but I believe we ultimately will. I don't know if it'll take two weeks or one week or three weeks, but it'll take a little bit of time. But uh, but we have to do something. And that's why I'm confident that we ultimately will do something that's meaningful. Yeah, uh, but the meter's running because uh, it sounds like those payments are going to be running out, I believe, at the end of this week. Um, Senator, yesterday, Mitch McConnell said, you know, the quandary we're in is right now America as a country. We've got one foot in the pandemic and one foot in the recovery. And there are a number of Republicans who say, look, we don't have the, the money to, you know, just keep writing gigantic checks. You are proposing the small business relief package. What is in that? Yeah, and you're, I can, uh, you're, the question is chopping in and out. So, but I think your question is, what is an RPPP proposal? Yeah. And um, and the answer is it's now it's more targeted. It's available. It's very similar to what we had before. Sixty percent for payroll, 40 percent for other expenses. That now includes the personal protective equipment and other technologies that they need in order to comply with local COVID restrictions and so forth. That costs money. Uh, but it's only available to businesses that are 300 employees or smaller who have suffered a 50 percent reduction in their revenues in either the first quarter of this year or the second quarter of this year compared to the same time frame a year ago. And, uh, and we also set aside some, some of that money for businesses with 10 employees or less, the sort of smaller mom and pop and micro businesses to make sure that there isn't a run on the first tranche of money and leaves mm -hmm. them behind. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, 2020. And uh, of course, the balance in the Senate is on everybody's mind on the Republican side. Democrats feel as though uh, it's, in, it's within shouting distance. So there's a huge difference between the minority and majority, and I don't have to tell you that. But let's talk about uh, the President of the United States, trailing in most battleground states. However, in the CBS tracking poll, they had him back leading Ohio. Knowing what you know from 2016, and also knowing what's ahead, the unknown with the pandemic and more, and China now, too. What does President Trump have to do to close the gap? Or are you one of the many who don't believe the polls? Yeah, look, I think polls are uh, the snapshot of a moment. They're not, you know, uh, the, I think nowadays there's a challenge. Polls and what they mean. But, I, but I'll say to you this, and that is once this election becomes a choice, right now it's, it's sort of a very strange environment because of the pandemic, everything else that's going on. But eventually this race becomes a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And when it becomes a choice between two candidates, uh, that's where I think Donald Trump will win. It'll be a close election. They always are, but I believe he'll win, and that includes Florida. Okay, I was reading your op-ed this morning, and you say everyone's asking these questions about COVID and reopening and sports. Will schools reopen in the fall, and can athletes safely compete? And you say yes, they can. How, what's your plan? How can we do this? Well, first of all, we have to understand we're mitigating risks. I mean, for example, the game of football already comes with inherent risks, right? And so, um, you know, if you leave it up to a lot of doctors, no kid would play football because, uh, because they, the game has inherent risk. We have to be in the job of mitigating risk, whether that's in our schools or that's in on the sports field. And we have to do the cost benefit analysis. There is benefits to opening schools. There are benefits to sports in high schools, especially especially because they attach a lot of kids to school. It's what keeps many of them coming back. It's what keeps many of them from dropping out. Yeah. And so we have to weigh those benefits against the potential costs. And I think you've got to lower the costs while taking advantage of the benefits. And so I do think you can safely return to school. Now, will it, will it, will it be on the scheduled date? Will we need some extra few weeks to get things ready? Will the season look the same as it looked in the past? Yeah. Of course not. I mean, it's going to be a different season. It's going to look different. It's going to feel different. And we have to be flexible and nimble. You know, in Florida, we have the option of maybe starting a season in October or November. We're not, we're not expecting snow this year over the winter months. And other places, they have different uh, challenges that they face. So we need to be flexible with it. Sure. Uh, just as baseball is trying to be with the Marlins, half the team uh, tested positive uh, yesterday. Uh, and, and down in, in Miami in particular, Senator, you know, it has been a hot spot, although we hear it's plateauing. Is part of the problem people are not getting the message about how you spread it and they're not doing the right stuff or what's going on? 
Well, I think part of the problem is we have large extended families, uh, as, as you know, in South Florida, a big Hispanic community. I'm a Hispanic. My family's Hispanic. We have big Hispanic. I mean, our family, for the most part, all lives in Miami-Dade County. Yep. We don't have a lot of relatives living in another part of the country that visit us on Thanksgiving and Christmas. So when you have a lot of family living together, you do have a lot of gatherings and people getting together. We also have densely populated areas. We have households, for example, in some parts of Miami-Dade where they're, you know, mom, dad, the four kids, the grandmother and the grandfather all live in the same house. So that's a factor as well. Um, so there's a, a variety of different factors in play. And, uh, and I am, look, we're starting to see the flu-like and COVID-like symptoms visits to the ERs begin to, to fall. That's usually the first indicator that you're going to start to see some drop off. We're hoping, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if people go back to doing what we were doing a month ago, the numbers will spike up again. So, um, Ultimately, a lot of credit to our doctors, our hospitals. They've improved outcomes. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping here that over the next few days and weeks, as people begin to sort of limit the number mm -hmm. of people they come in contact with, we can begin to bring this more under control.